<clears throat> just because we, again, have so much content. All right, so this talk is going to cover authentication as a microservice. Just a really quick rant on microservices. Everybody's kind of doing them. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, they're not great for every application. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you're building stuff out. This talk is actually applicable to non-microservice architectures as well. So keep that in mind as well. All right, quick bio on me. My name is Brian Ponarelli. I founded a company called Inversoft like 11 years ago. I've been doing security stuff at companies like BEA, Orbit, um, US Freightways, those kind of things uh, for many, many moons. Been coding for about 20 plus years. Uh, I'm a big beer junkie. Um, and uh, one of my favorite beers is this a cool place in uh, Colorado called Elevation. And they make a really good quadruple. It's called Apis. So if anybody's in Colorado and wants to grab a beer, I'm down. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way back in time, and we're going to talk about authentication, and then we're going to flash forward to where we are today. Stop me if you have questions, and I'm just going to keep cranking through. All right, so in the beginning, the monolithic application, right, looked kind of like this. You might have an app, mobile, whatever. Um, Brian, have a browser, and it's hitting your back end, and it's this big monster. So I like to say back in the Orbitz days, we had you know, basically one monolithic application, and then we started to rip it apart. We had one big monolithic database, started to rip that thing apart. Um, but they're cumbersome, right? So there's a lot of reasons why these things are challenging, why people are going to microservices. So let's look at a standard database. I just made a little to-do example. So this is our to-do database. It has a user table. You have some roles. Um, a join between those two, users can have multiple roles, all that, yada, yada, and then you have users, or to-dos, sorry, and the users belong to, or uh, to-dos belong to a user. Okay, <clears throat> so here's what our table looks like. Really simple table, create to-dos, we have some foreign keys in here, so yay, foreign keys. Um, this, this little cascade on delete here is super important, right? Help us clean everything up, so we'll get to that later. All right, so how did we log into these apps? Let's assume it's a web app. And we would go to slash login, right? And it would send us back HTML, and that would be your login page, hopefully over SSL. But you never know. All right, so then we filled out the form and we posted back, and again, hopefully over SSL. Uh, well, TLS, but yeah, everyone calls it SSL. And so we would post back to login, and we would send it our form data. And what it would do is it would go to the database, look us up, make sure all the passwordness is good, and then it would create a session, right? So a session is basically just a big hash on the server, and it would jam our user object into the hash, and then it would send us back a 302 redirect to wherever we're going, along with a really long opaque token, which is just our session ID. And that would get stored as a cookie or jammed on the URL in some fashion, right? So pretty classic stuff. All right, now we want to go fetch our to-dos. We got to link all that back up, so what we do is we pass back that cookie to our slash to-dos, and the back end looks us up in the session using that big long opaque token, rips our user object out of the session and now can go happily look up our to-dos and sends those back as HTML. Totally straightforward. Everybody's hopefully seen this. Um, okay, so here's what our select looked like back in the old days. We just looked them up. User, the user's ID is 42. Right? We got that out of the session. Okay, so this works. Right? This is a classic. It works. It still works. You don't have to not do this, even though a lot of people like, I might tell you not to do this, but I won't. Um, a lot of people tell you not to do this. Sessions are tried and true. They've been working for a very long time. Cookies work. They're secure. Everything works, right? So this stuff works. So don't feel like you don't have to implement it this way. It's just I'm going to show you another way to do it. But uh, it works on everything. Your session ID becomes your identifier. That's basically you. Generally speaking, kind of hard to steal cookies, hard to, almost impossible to forge them. These are really, really long ints, basically. Um, and, you know, they're secure. It's a really good semantic that the browsers have about cookies and the OS, right? So, all right, so what, why is this painful? Well, we have state, right? So our back end has that big global hash. Now you could store it in the database. You could share it. You could session pin people, right? So if you have, like, 12 of these boxes serving up your back end application, you might have to lock somebody to one of them. And then what that does is it basically passes them back a cookie that pins them to that back end server because that's where their session is. If they go to another server, their session won't be there. So that, we call that session pinning. Um, these things are harder to scale. You've got to think a lot about session replication. You've got to think about zero downtime. Generally speaking, you have one big clunky database because it's got all your crap and a lot of foreign keys. Um, 
So it's, it's, it's tough. But it works really well for a lot of applications. All right, so let's rip it apart. We're going to rip these things apart, and we're going to make it a to-do API, and we're going to make a user API, because it's all microservice-y and cool. And then we're going to put them in containers, and it's going to be even cooler. All right, so now we can fundamentally rip apart our databases, because we're not tied to having a single database. Each of our microservices can have its own database. So let's go ahead and do that as well. We'll have a user database and a to-do database. All right, so here's what the user database looks like. All I did was remove the to-dos table. Totally straightforward. It's got all the user junk in it. Here's what our to-do database looks like. Here's what our new create statement looks like. So you'll notice no foreign key. But we do have a user ID still. We just don't have a foreign key. OK. So let's walk through the evolution of like what we do with this. OK, so we're going to hit the user API. What should, we, what should we send it and what should we get back? I'm just skipping the whole form part of the process. But we're posting the form with our username and password. And I just made it a mobile app because you know, now we're hip and modern. OK, so what we're going to send it is we're going to send it our user. It's going to go fetch the user, but it's not going to set up state. It's not going to have a session. So let's just, let's just do the easy way. We'll just pass the user object back as JSON. And then we'll store the JSON in the phone. It might look something like this. Put it in you know, whatever storage you want. Pretty straightforward. I jammed some roles on there just for fun. OK, now I'm going to go get my to-do. So I'm going to call my to-do API. And I'm going to pass in just you know, my user ID of 42. And then I get my to-dos, and they come back as JSON. Straightforward? Everybody got it? All right. Yeah, so this is bad, right? I mean, this is just, what's that? It's insecure to write Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> OK, so now I can totally mess with somebody. Yay. So whose uh, ID is one? Admin, root, yeah, of course. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just going to, oops. Sorry, Blaster. I'm just going to keep checking off his, like, get he'll never get milk. He'll be so frustrated. All right, so let's fix it. Uh, we're going to now pass in a, um, we're going to manage this with tokens, right? So don't pass in an ID. We're going to go back to sort of our session identifier thing. Um, did I skip something? No, I'm good. OK. Um, all right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to tokenize everything. So rather than using oh, oh, just IDs, we're going to use a token. Exact same way we did before with sessions, we're just going to pass them back to the phone. And then the phone is going to happily go use that token to look the user up. Right? It's an opaque token. It's just basically a long set of garbage characters. And so now we have to have a token reconciliation or a token lookup. What we need is we need to pass that token and get a user object back. Because really what we need is the user ID, which is not in the token. So then I call get through a token API to the user API, and then it returns me my user. OK, and this works. This is how a lot of like, OAuth implementations actually work. All right, so there has to be a user token mapping at all points in the user API. You can store it in memory. You can store it in the database. I don't care, wherever. But there's a mapping. This stuff gets really chatty, right? Because if everybody is going, constantly going back to the user API to look the user up, it can get really chatty. So you, there's a lot of ways to fix that. You can like go get the user object once and then pass the user object around to all your sub APIs. And, but what you're all basically doing is you're saying, OK, well, everything in the universe is coupled to our user API now because I need to exchange these tokens. I might be past a token, and I need a user object. So I'm going to exchange it or look it up. So it's very coupled. All right, so now let's go to the new hotness. Well, not new. It's kind of old now. but. Um, we're going to make it a JSON web token. Right? So instead of just having an opaque token, like an OAuth access token, OAuth 1, whatever, um, we're going to send back a JSON web token. All right, so what is a JSON web token? Right? So these things are basically just JSON, and they're in Base64 encoded. And they're, they can be signed, they can be validated, and they're completely portable. So that's the big win here, is because we can sign and validate them, they're portable. I can send them to any surface. That service can verify that it was created by the, pers you know, the person who has authority to create it. And they can verify it's actually me. Right? You can't mangle a jot, because then the signature gets screwed up. And you can put anything you want in a jot. So it can contain your rules, which is another thing you probably want access to. All right, so let's look at a jot. And let's break it into pieces. All right, so a jot is a three-part Base64 encoded blob. And they're separated by periods. 
The first part is the header, second part is the body, and the third part is the signature. If I decode my header, it looks like this type and algorithm. The algorithm is how it was signed or encrypted, potentially. Um, I don't know why they insist on using three characters for this stuff. I guess they're like, oh, it's going to be too big. I need to save you know, two bytes. Okay. <clears throat> and here's what the body looks like. So if I decode the body, I'll get this out. So these is, these, this is just JSON, and it has um, a number of different claims. right? So spec calls them claims. And there's a number of them that are standard, but you can put anything you want in it. So issue, I, issuer, that's just who created it. Um, expiration, when it expires, these are all required. Talk about expiration a little later. Uh, the audience is, uh, who is this for? What application? So usually this is an application ID. Uh, subject is you, it's the user ID. I just, I'm using UUIDs here, a little more portable. Uh, and, and then I have uh, custom claims. So I have name and roles, right? So that's, that's just information about me. And then that's the signature, right? So it's just this arch, RSA or HMAC. Lots of different reasons why you would use one or the other. Um, and if you want to talk about that after or now, I can talk about it, right? So. All right, so how does our to-do select change? Well, now we rip apart that jot, we validate that it's good, we verify it, and now we can just grab the ID out of it and jam it into our to-do. So yay, so it's portable. I don't have to go back to the user API to figure this junk out anymore. Cool, all right, so in the, because we have short time, I can show code or I can skip it. It's node, and so I apologize for that, first and foremost, but uh, I can show code if you guys want all to skip it and keep tr trucking along. Show of hands, code? Okay, not enough, sorry. If you wanna see code, come up and see me afterwards, I'll show you code. It's, this stuff's really, really straightforward and we like, you can parse jots and do a lot of things with them just writing JavaScript and very few lines of code. Okay, <clears throat> let's quickly talk about some of the hacks because these are the ones that everybody complains about. They're like, oh, jots are insecure. I'm like, no, they're not, only if you're an idiot. All right, so one of the biggest hacks that people talk about is this none algorithm. I don't know why the spec decided that this was okay, but they did. Basically what you can do is you can say that your algorithm is none and then not have a signature. I think they did that because they wanted a standardized format that's not JSON, but JSON, I don't know. I mean, it's, it boggles the mind. And so here's what it looks like. So I'm gonna take my signature, I'm gonna rip it off, I'm gonna go to my header, change it to none, re-encode it, jam it back on, and I have a valid jot, yay! All right, so don't do this. <laughs> Just don't allow none. It's super simple. If none, throw exception, right? Just don't do that. Okay. Other J, uh, JWT hacks. So there's this HMAC hack that's kind of interesting, and the way it works is uh, HMAC uses a shared secret, all right? So it's basically a password that you know and I know. And so I sign it with the password that I know, I give it to you, and you verify it with the password that you know as well. One of the downsides with HMAC is that anyone who can verify a JOT can also create a JOT, right? So if I have the secret, I can just start creating JOTs even though I may not, or you know, I shouldn't be allowed to do that. That might be a bad idea. Well, there's a really interesting little hack. If you decide to pass a jot back to someone, and in the header, you can tell them which key to use to verify it. And it comes through in a header parameter called KID. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and what KID is basically, it's just a string, and it says, this is the key I want you to use. So what you can do is you can actually go and pass in the signature as the key ID. So let me show you what it looks like. Okay, so here's our header, right? Wait, hang on. Yeah, that's right. All right, so here's the header, and it's telling us that we're gonna use an RSA public key, private key. So what I can do is I can actually just go look up the public key, grab it as a string, and then I can tell the backend to use that string as the shared HMAC secret. So what I'll do is I'll just change the jot Resign it with this text right here being our HMAC shared secret, because remember, these are just big strings. And then I re-sign the jot after I've mangled it, pass it back, and I say, hey, by the way, 
here's your key ID, which is the public key, right? So it's a little bit tricky. So really the only thing I have to change is the, the algorithm in the header. So if it's kind of confusing, because it kind of is, um, I can show you afterwards, or there's a lot of documentation on this. And so the key here is when you're going to look up the key that you're trying to verify a jot with, make sure it's the same type that you've defined as your algorithm. So it's a really simple fix. If you have a hash of keys, or you know, shared secrets, or whatever they might be, when you look it up, just have a type with it. So you say key 52, well, I'm expecting it to be HMAC. Is it HMAC? No, it's supposed to be RSA. Just reject that jot. Right? Pretty straightforward. All right, RSA val verification. So uh, there's a number of different ways to do this. The to-do API needs to verify this jot, right? So we need to get that dude the public key. So what we could do is we could just drop it as a file on that box. It's pretty easy. We could write an API where they can go look it up and cache it. And the OpenID spec um, defines these as well. So it's called a well-known. Uh, you can hit the well-known API in OpenID Connect. It'll send you back where your keys are. And right, so here's what they might look like, right? Public key, it's just JSON maybe. So when I go hit that API to get my keys, I get a key back, and it just comes back as JSON. Then I cache that, and then I can use that to verify jots that are coming in, just verify the RSA signature. Cool? All right, so what happens if you have multiple keys? You might want to rotate your keys. The keys might expire, whatever. We talked a little bit about this in the hack section, but all you do is you add a new header, call a KID, and I just said 42, and that just tells me which key I need to go look up. And again, so remember, when you go look up this key ID, make sure that it's an RSA key and people aren't hacking you by swapping out keys. And here's what your JSON might look like from either a well-known or you can write these APIs yourself. That's really straightforward, right? You can store your keys in a database and then just return the public keys via an API. Any questions thus far? I'll pause really quick. Cool. We are cranking. We might actually finish all my slides. Then we can look at some code if you want. Sweet. Okay. Yeah. I'll go for a quick one. Sure. So, uh, RS-256, um, NIST actually recommends changing to the PS-256. Parabolic. But I see that in a lot of the implementations. Yeah, most people don't implement that stuff. Okay. Um, I don't know. We don't, we don't actually implement that right now either. So, yeah, I think it's just a lot of the algorithms are complicated. Um, they're really time consuming, so you can implement it. Um, I have another talk called uh, Hack Proof Security, and I talk specifically about why algorithms should be slow, right? A lot of people don't want to take the hit of them being slow. So I'll rabbit hole for a really quick second here. We want encryption and hashing to be as slow as humanly possible, right? It's counterintuitive as developers, we want everything to be fast as humanly possible. In this case, we want it to be slow as humanly possible, within reason. And the reason being is that if I give you a password hash and it takes you very, very little time to compute those hashes, you can try all possible combinations really fast. So for example, if I'm using MD5 as a hashing algorithm, again, don't do this because it's bad, and you have up to 10 characters, I think 10, um, on a Bitcoin rig, a modern one, you can crack every single possible combination of every password with 10 characters in about 17 minutes with MD5, right? So these are, that, that's why we want it to be slow. If we write an algorithm that makes our password hashing really slow, like every hash is taking like a second, then that's good because then it'll take infinity time, right? And it's super, because these, these numbers are huge, it'll take so long for the computers to process and try brute forcing every single password variance. So just keep that in mind. That's why a lot of people aren't implementing them is the complexity is high and they're really slow. But it's, it's good that they're slow. So that's why some people do it because they need that level of, of security. So slow is good. Except when you're like, you know, trying to log somebody in to get them to play a game or something. Then you want to get them in as quickly as possible. So there's a balance between speed and usability. So. All right, so, yep. Yep. 
Oh, yeah, they can DDoS the hell out of you. It is. They can DDoS it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, and we've seen that before. We've seen um, machines get totally crushed by just doing token verification or like password hashing. So if you're using like a bcrypt 13 or 14 right now, which is really heavy, all you need to do is just log into a bank of machines every couple milliseconds and you'll, you'll crush it because bcrypt is really slow. Cool, all right, so refresh tokens. So we have our JOTs, right? JOTs are, are now our coolness that we can pass around, we can verify them, and we can get data out of them. But they're supposed to be short-lived. And the reason being is that they, because they're a portable unit of identity, they're you. Well, you might have changed over time, so that JOT becomes invalid. And the JOT can't be updated. It needs to be, a new one needs to be created. So the way that most people do this is through refresh tokens. JOTs are designed to, be, to live for minutes, some people do it for seconds, yeah, whatever your flavor is. Uh, and then refresh tokens are the long-lived things, right? So refresh tokens need to be secured more than anything else in your entire system because they're the thing that are, that's you, and it also allows somebody that has that to create tokens as you and do things as you. Okay. All right, so here's what it looks like really quick. So now back in the user API, we create a token, a refresh token and a JSON web token. Oh, by the way, so I'm sure you all know this, but it's called JOT, and that's actually defined in the spec. So when you hear people say JOT, it's a JSON web token. Okay, so the server is going to manage these refresh tokens. It can store them in the database, it can store them in memory, whatever. But it's going to send that refresh token back, and that refresh token needs to be locked to that device, right? and it has to be super secured. So just keep that in mind. When you're sending refresh tokens back, use the most secure transport you can. Yeah, so don't store anything in local storage. It's really insecure, like really insecure. Um, store it in uh, secure cookies, right? Because then you, you get... Stick the JWT and the cookie. Yep, stick the JWT and the refresh token in a cookie. So just like hit Facebook or Google Plus, which is going to die soon, or where, you know, whatever your flavor is, um, and just open up your inspector, and you'll see all your cookies. And they name them like a bunch of random things. They also have a CSERF token in there, um, but you'll see them. And you'll have a refresh token, basically a JOT, like Google uses JOTs, Facebook doesn't, um, Twitter doesn't either. How about the JWT itself? You can store the JWT in a cookie. You can store the JWT in local storage. It depends on your tolerance for uh, security. I guess right? where I'm coming to is like, there's no standard that I know about for like, how should you safely transmit things out of local storage, like the JWT? Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you get it for free when you're making AJAX requests, or you're making requests to the server, right? The cookies just fly across, and that's just part of the browser, um, which, is, which is why most people store them in secure cookies. So they are not hackable. You can't get to them from JavaScript. Now, some folks put them in local storage. And so the kicker there is that unverified um, JavaScript and, you know, JavaScript that came from cross-site can now get at your local storage, right? Because it's not secure and it's not local only. So, there's reasons why you, you might want to do that for a period of time and then move, move it out or something. Um, pardon me, JOTs are way better because they're short-lived, right? So eventually they're going to expire and then they're worthless. So it's, oh, it's better to, if you're going to put anything in local storage, put the JOT. Don't put the refresh token. And then put it in secure storage on mobile. Yep. Sorry, what was that? Yeah. Authorization headers, yeah. So, yeah, when you're making calls back, you can use an auth header, but that would force you to store it somewhere that JavaScript can get at it, like local storage, right? So just be careful, right? So like, there's a lot of ways to do this. There's no standard. Um, so just make good decisions based on what you know about the security semantics of a browser, cookies, headers, AJAX, secure storage on mobile, whatever it might be. Keychains, like you can open up somebody's keychain, store it in there, get it out, totally fine, right? Because that, that's a secure storage. And Face ID or Touch ID or whatever can unlock that. So, any other questions? Yeah? Um, and what about uh, the situation where you want to refresh to your remote? Like someone 
All right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, revocation, right? Very nice segue. I, that's not a plant at all. Um, <laughs> so, just really quick, there's a funny story. The first time I did this, um, I, I was looking to make sure I spelled revocation correctly, and it came up with this death metal band, which I thought was hilarious. And then I did the talk, and the dude in the audience is like, I'm going to revocation tonight. And I'm like, you're kidding. He's like, nope, they're playing it tonight in Denver. We're going. I'm like, oh my god. I didn't go, but it's funny. All right, so yeah, logout API. So let me jump really quick actually through this. So the logout API just says delete all your tokens, right? So that's an easy one. But let's actually talk about, I'm going to flash forward really fast here. Let's talk about actual revocation. Because these tokens, are you want to expire them. You want them to be deleted, right? So there's, this is impossible according to the spec. And because they're portable, it's a unit of identity. I can send it to an API. It can validate it. It's me. It does something for me, even though my user might have been deleted. So we came up with this really cool little tricky system. It's really fun. What you do is you basically set up a webhook. When you delete a refresh token, a user, or any of these things, you send an event to a webhook. And what it does is it basically says, hey, I just revoked things for this user right now, at this millisecond. Then what we can do is we can start to divide this up and figure out the time range when JOTs and refresh tokens become invalid. OK, following? OK, so right now, I haven't updated this in a really long time. Apologize. Let's assume right now it's November 9th, 2017 at 1.12.47 PM. OK, and that's when we revoke. That's when that event comes from the webhook. OK, any new JOT that we create right now, this very second, will expire 30 minutes from now, because let's just say our JOTs last for 30 minutes. Good? OK, one second ago, a jot that was created one second ago will expire at this time. One second, 30 minutes from now, but one second less. Therefore, every jot that expires before this time is now invalid. So we're just moving the window. We're basically saying you, have to, you can only accept jots when their expiration is after that time. Everybody following? So it looks like this. So that's our time window from like, you know, again, I didn't update this, sorry. Um, 6, 4, 12, 47 to 6, 42, 47. Everything in that red is dead. Even though the jot themselves are valid and OK, we're just telling this back ends, just throw it out. Because we revoke them, they're bad. Everything in the green that's been created later is now valid. And everything in the blue has already expired because it's before now. Does this make sense? OK, so this is kind of a cool little tricky, hacky way to revoke jots. There are a couple of other ways. You can store them on the server and stuff. But, yeah. So my question is, you basically, uh, if somebody is, is, if you did a validation session here by doing this, you're revoking a set of tokens, it's just going to require everybody who is, has been validated to refresh, because all their jots are going to be within that expired time. Yeah, you can do it that way. So we, uh, so in our system, our IDP, we have three different ways to do this. One of which is global revoke, which forces everybody out. One of which is an application revoke, which basically says everyone who has a jot for this app, get out. And then one is a user level revoke. So you get all three. So you could do it as granular as just the user if you wanted to. Because you know the user's ID, because it's in the jot. That's exactly correct. Yep, you're pushing an anti-session out. And really, it's really lightweight. It's a user ID and an int, or a long, which is our time, right? So, so assuming that revocations are much rarer than tests? Yes, agreed. And if they're not, that's why we let, allow you to do it at an app level. Again, very because we didn't want to store 1 million entries in a hash to figure out all the users that are revoked, just store it at a global level. So you can say all tokens are revoked. So in our hash to manage this stuff, we, have, we actually have three hashes. One is global level, one's application level, and one's user level. And they roll off really quickly, right? Because if I say, here's a timestamp, 30 minutes, and we just wake up like every six or seven seconds, and we're like, hey, is it dead? Is it dead? Because it's all in RAM, so this is pretty lightweight. 
So if I want to global kill everybody, I'd be like, hey, guess what, big red button, everybody log in again, I can, and I can tell all the backend services with one hash entry, everyone's dead. And that hash entry is literally, or it's actually not even a hash, it's a global static. It's literally, uh, this is the timestamp for everybody's jocks to be revoked. So lots of ways to manage it lightly, cool. All right, let's go back up really quick. Um, yep. Um, at the beginning, you said session ID, uh, session, session management, it's tried and true. Um, tried and so true. The, the library gives you reputation for free, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar for um, JWT where a library that does give you reputation for free, like this Prime, is there? Or is this something you need to implement on your own generally? Yeah, because it's not part of the spec. It's just something like that we came up, we solved this for um, uh, Wells Fargo. So it was one, we were working with them and they were like, oh, we need to revoke JOTS. I'm like, okay, fine, here, this is how you do it. Um, and so there's no spec definition for this, it's just something we dreamed up. So very few libraries use it or have it. Ours does, because we implemented it. So our JOT library does all the correct JOTness stuff according to spec, but then it also provides this, just as kind of a little nicety. I don't know if any of the other ones do. But it's really easy to write. I can show you code afterwards. I mean, this stuff is literally like 40 lines of code. So easy. Yep. There are backends that uh, only OAuth will take in and give you an interesting uh, sort of access token with the OAuth token. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk and touch upon that? Oh, sure. Yeah, so OAuth 2 uh, access tokens can just be JOTs. And a lot of OAuth 2 implementations, they are JOTs. So if you're going to do an authorization grant, right? Go over there, log in, come back here with a code, authorization code, call via backend API to the token endpoint, right, with my code, which <laughs> code is really just a big, long, opaque token. Authorization codes should always be opaque tokens. Keep that in mind. You call to the backend with your big, long, opaque token, and then what it sends you back is not an opaque access token, which is like OAuth1-ish. It sends you back a JOT. So if you look at what most OAuth 2 implementations are doing, that's it. There are a few that don't. So like Facebook implements OAuth 2, but they refuse to use JOTS, which is fine, because OAuth 2 does not require you to use JOTS. JOTS are an extension to OAuth 2, and then on top of, it goes OAuth 2, JOT, OpenID Connect. That's the layering. So you don't have to, but you can. And what, that's a really good, another really good point here is that when I hate bearer, if that keyword dies, I will be a happy camper. It's the dumbest thing. It doesn't mean anything. So what we suggest is use a different s scheme. Just tell me what it is. It's a jot. And it's so easy. Instead of saying like authorization bearer token, just say authorization jot token. A lot of people disagree with me on that. So that's, uh, I'm, it's a little contentious, but I do not like bearer. If you're gonna tell me it's opaque, say opaque and then the token. Jot, the token. So, so there are schemes where you're not using a bearer token. I would argue that sure. Jot token is still a bearer token. It is. Uh, I agree, but you don't know what it is. It's up to the implementation to tell you and document it properly, or you just brute force it and you're like, well, I'm going to see if it's a Jot. You try decoding it and it explodes. And you're like, nope, not a Jot. So security through obfuscation never works, and I think that's what a lot of people are saying it is, because bearer is really just the signifier, right? It just tells me what it is. It's not an API key, it's a token, it's a bearer token. So why not just say JOT token? Or just bearer JOT. Bearer JOT, Any, I mean, it's a freeform string, right? So HTTP only says this has to be a string and here are the allowed characters for this part of the header, right? I could call it Fred, right? I could call it like death metal revocation is awesome, right, whatever, it doesn't matter. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's my rant for the day. Yep. Slightly off topic, but you still So you can encrypt individual values. You can't encrypt the entire body. Is my time up? I'm just checking. Yeah. Um, you can't encrypt the entire body. That's a, called a JWE. It's an encrypted JOT. The whole thing is encrypted. You can encrypt individual values in the JOT and then have them decrypted on the server, and that's totally fine. But it has to be well-formed JSON, Base64 encoded. It has to be, according to spec. So great question. Yeah. And you always, <laughs> yes, 
<laughs> the question was, does encryption cause performance issues? Yeah, definitely. Like, you have to be so careful with this stuff. And actually, it, so I, I don't think it's in this one. We have tons of metrics around how slow JSON parsing is, how slow RSA verification is, how slow HMAC is. Um, it, and so the numbers are interesting, right? So you have to be careful with this stuff. This stuff is slow. And if you're at scale, every little thing matters. So be careful with your encryption. The way around, yeah. Have you, have you benchmarked that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, RSA is really slow to sign, really fast to verify. Right. Parabolic is, yeah. So and there's other algorithms that you can make them slow on both sides. So are you finding you get overall better persistent performance with RSA versus elliptic? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, all right, so it depends on how long your jots expire. If your jots are longer lived, then you do less signing, right? You do more verification. If your jots are really short, like let's say you keep them around, I don't know, for like three seconds, five seconds, <laughs> um, you got to do a lot of signing, right? So it's going to be really heavy. So then you want to pick an algorithm that is better but still secure on both sides. Yeah. So it's just your semantics of your app. Yep. They can. Yes, yeah, so you can use them for anything. You can store any data you want in them. So our jots specifically store the user ID, user core data that's not like secure data, like social security number, and then um, roles, the roles for the app audience, which in our case is an application ID. So like, let's say you log into the forums and you want to know the roles for that user. Is that user moderator? Can they delete posts that, from other people? Can they only delete their own posts, et cetera? You can store that in the jot. So, but it is only signed, right? So signed. Well, is, so here's the kicker. Is a role sensitive? Got to make a decision. Because you can't change the user's roles, and roles are usually just strings. <laughs> so in our case, we, we feel that they're not. It's just a bit of data that doesn't, it's nonsensical to a hacker. And they can't change it and make themselves become admin, because it's signed. So, all right, I think my time is up. Yeah, if you guys want to know more, come, come up here, I'll be around. Thanks. <clears throat>